right, I guess uh, we're going to get started then. I think I see everybody I need to see. Where's the Feldman? Don't see a Feldman. There's the Feldman. What, what timing? All right, anybody know anybody we should wait for? We go? All right, so um, oh, welcome everybody. Seemingly this uh, BOF is going to answer all of the universe's problems and questions and everything else in between. Um, so clearly the answer is going to be that we'll get nothing done. But um, the, the, I, I actually wanted to cover two major points, and I think uh, it's, it, behooves us all as part of this community to keep that in mind for everything that we're going to talk about today. The number one thing is that Linux as a networking model has to be something that we all have to preserve and, and work to preserving. Because if we don't have the ability to talk about the Linux networking stack as something that is inviolate, that, as something that's very predictable, then the end result becomes that interoperation between different companies, groups, products, technologies, it runs the risk of going down the Unix way, right? It all, it's all perfectly symmetric and applicable as an API or as per standards, but when you actually try to use it against each other, it doesn't work. And I, I think that's the only sort of high level theme that I want to uh, make sure we all follow. The second thing I want to say is that at least from my perspective, the goal here is not to try to answer questions as much as not necessarily ask them, but exchange ideas. Make sure that people who have, um, if dissenting, if, uh, opin if at all opinions that say that might be popular consensus, but that doesn't address my use case, this would be the place to have that conversation. So having said that, I put together a, a, a fantasy agenda, and uh, we'll go through the list uh, real quick, and then you'll see some of the topics have names associated with them because people have um, upfront done some preparation for it and asked for slots. In some cases, I have put people's names there because uh, it's good to surprise people from time to time. So if you are seeing your name there for the first time right now, surprise. Uh, um, and, uh, and I'm sure there are more people here who might want to talk about certain topics. Uh, let's keep this informal. The reason why we have a lot of time is we have two different sections or segments of time. Let's keep it open, have the discussions we need to have, uh, which was why I was hoping we could all sit a little closer as a group, but I was told for privacy reasons, the video cameras will not swing to the back, and uh, if you're going to talk, uh, you'll have to come up here and, and uh, be in front of the camera. Um, so with that, let's... Let the games begin, um, unless there are other things, points that people want to raise before we start. Okay. Um, so uh, let's start with the topic that has seen some discussion. Uh, Patrick was, I was just talking with Patrick about this at lunch. I know Patrick has had lots of discussions with the, with the Linux networking uh, heads, so to say, about it, and that is mostly about, uh, about capacity management and explicit capability management. Whether or not we have a, 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 a box that has got some capability, and whether we can extend that in software or not, and whether we can handle, for example, more routes than what the hardware can do, or more ACLs than what the hardware can do, or more uh, bridge FDB entries than what the hardware can do. Me personally, I think I have a very explicit position because we are very focused on the data center space. And uh, in that, failure has to be deterministic and guaranteed. If it's not going to work in hardware, it might as well not work. But since, uh, Patrick, you were talking about it, maybe you want to suggest what you were talking about? Yeah, right now. <laughs> Why not? I, I mean, we can do it informally with the mic right there, or we can have you up. Yeah. 
Well, we were just talking about um, how to handle um, when hardware capacity is exceeded. And the problem seems to be that um, it's hard to um, take individual, when you offload routes and hardware capacity is exceeded, it's apparently hard to take individual routes out of hardware because you have a default route in hardware. So basically you will change how routing goes. So this doesn't seem to be an option. Um, my question was whether it's possible to remove the default route, at which point you um, get a lot more flexibility because you, at that point you can take each individual route out and pass it to software without actually changing uh, the packet flow. Well, except for minor reordering issues, of course, but um <coughs> so you gain a lot more flexibility. And um, I guess my point was um, it's best to have some automatic um, resolution mechanism. Um, the hardware provides some counters where you can actually measure activity of the routes if they're used or not. And if you have like 500,000 routes in, uh, offloaded to hardware, it's very likely that most of them won't be used at all. So my opinion was if the default route is not very actively used um, because it's only used for local services like DNS resolution or something like that, the best solution would be to simply um, take the default route out um, under the assumption that it's not seeing much traffic anyway. And at that point you gain the flexibility to take all the inactive routes out um, when you um, exceed hardware ca um, capabilities. And basically the um, conflict resolution mechanism becomes very simple. Um, under the presumption that you are able to take out the default route. And well, that was basically our discussion during lunch. Um, I'm actually not sure why I'm holding the talk now. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, this is kind of inevitable, so I might as well get up here now. <laughs> So uh, actually, I had a discussion with Patrick last night on these topics too. So, uh, uh, so one of the things I want to address first off is that uh, I think a primary goal in all of this is that tools that work today continue to work, whether you, regardless of whether you have a hardware offload device underneath or not. That being said, this is how we get into this, the discussion of what, what do we do when capacity is reached, et cetera, et cetera. Initially, there was some ideas were about, uh, so, okay, so there are two realms of conflicting needs in this space, okay? So me, as the kernel networking maintainer, I want the kernel to be as simple as possible, so I like the things that are very simple and pop up all the policy up to the user space, okay? On the other hand, uh, users want things to just do what they, you've told them to do, and if today with the software-based implementation it does X, it, it probably should still do X. In order to do that, I can't meet my goal of maximal minim minimalism of the kernel. There has to be some level of policy inserted into the kernel. Actually, we talked about that yesterday during dinner, and um, we were talking about not really um, the case they are facing. Um, we were talking about a case where you have uh, dealing with tens of routes, but the hardware apparently has capa uh, capacity for half a million routes. So at that point, the routes are not added manually anymore, but it's definitely added by a daemon. So um, this right, is so where you would where you can easily put the conflict res uh, resolution mechanism. Um, the kernel can stay simple, and um, the case is different if you have like ten, tens of routes to offload. At that point, they will most likely be created manually. And in that case, if the user explicitly creates a route, my point of view is that it should become active and it should not fail. The user explicitly told you he wants that route, so for transparency reasons, um, it should actually behave, um, it should do what he told uh, the hardware to do. So I if it can't handle that, it should pull the routes out. I agree. Uh, and also, at, at the point in time that we're adding all these new facilities, we also have to have a way to say, please signal me an error if you can't fit it in the hardware, I would like a notification. <laughs> okay, that's one way of doing this. Yeah, sure. The other way is to take something like John Fastabend's, uh discovery mechanism, and then it's your you, you should figure out what the hardware is capable of doing and, and build your tables to that in that mechanism. I completely agree. Um, this also applies to the much smaller devices. If you design um, some system based on some very small chip which only has capacity for like five routes, then in my opinion it's your responsibility to take care of not exceeding these capabilities or else fall back to software. But it's basically a system designer's um, problem and not um, the kernel shouldn't, be, shouldn't deal with that stuff. It's right. So at the very beginning all the commands should just work as they do today. Yeah, period. that is. So that's the baseline that we, well. we have to deal with. 
Okay. I want to also go on to something that Patrick discussed earlier, the, the large system versus the big system discussion. I almost want to say that you don't want this, what, what a person who has the capacity for that and has that many routes, what they're offloading is the fact that no matter what route lookup is asked to me, it will be done in hardware. Yeah, right. Do you understand that? Because that, that, that's the DOSing ability of a remote entity is that they can, they can get into a slow path of you. Absolutely. My point with uh, these half a million of routes was um, you will have uh, the active routes will be specific routes. Uh, the default route most likely will only be used for some local services like DNS or whatever. Um, so the default route won't be a very active route, um, which so you uh, po it's possible to uh, push this one to the CPU. If you don't have the default route, at that point you gain a lot of flexibility in managing, in deciding which one to take out and which one to leave in. And the hardware apparently provides uh, the information to make so this deci decision. Right, so actually we are doing exactly that today, right? So we use gleaning as, as a way to learn things in the CPU and we will send things up. We don't send the default route up, we say unlearned neighbors up today. And it works reasonably well. We let ARP resolve through the CPU, and we we, we eventually fill in the details. Default route has the potential of it being a meltdown case because you a poorly designed <laughs> sure. network. Everyone is expecting all routes to be forwarded through the default route. You'll have a problem. But I think I, I think the the part that you were getting today was reasonably common enough, right? If you have a generic signaling mechanism, and let's say the switch dev driver or whoever else, as a I mean, actually in some sense this has to be the net dev SRIOV, all of those drivers saying, I have a capacity that I am about to exceed, and with some skid, um, some user space policy manager has to tell me how I'm going to proceed some from Some newly now. implemented user space component. Yeah. Because everything be that exists right now should do should that. Work. Yeah, exactly. The question is if it does need to be a new component. I mean, if you're dealing with half a million routes, those routes will have been added by routing demons, so let this one take care of the conflict resolution as well, I guess. What I'm saying is something like Quagga could be extended yes, to, yes, to exactly. make decisions yes. is, what is, is what we're kind of going towards. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Uh, another important point I want to make is uh, <coughs> it's not that I don't care exactly how these things are implemented, but what I do care <laughs> about are two things. First is that we come to, we decide what to do, and then we have a very good story about why we made the decisions we made. Because someone's going to say, You've designed things in such a way that uh, I don't think my hardware component can optimally be supported by Linux. Or what's it? Why did you make this trade-off? We have to be able to tell them why we did everything we did. So that's what's important to me because people are going to tell me that we made a bad decision. I'm going to have to come up with a good response to that challenge. So, so uh, actually, uh, along those notes, uh, um, I don't know if people noticed. We have an Etherpad set up, and Scott up here is going to be adding all the things that Dave and Patrick just said. Uh, and, and anybody else can go ahead and add them, because this is one of the things that needs to come out of this meeting, is some rationalization for all the thoughts that we've had. Right, totally agree. Yeah, we were talking yesterday about adding specific flags to the route add command. Um, so you can say, um, basically, f add it to hardware or fail. And I was opposing that. Um, under the circumstances that you're dealing with a device with very few rules, and it will hand, uh, happen with manually added rules. If you have a routing daemon, I don't uh, uphold that point. I think if you have a routing daemon, this flag makes sense. The and flag is for intelligence. Yes, it seems to make sense to me. Okay. For And also, uh, it's also valuable because that flag can be used on dumps to, d to tell the user what entries are right. actually in the hardware. Right. Seems and to so make for sense. diagnosis and also for adding intelligence on the, on the configuration side. Yeah. So, so could we agree on that? So there's one point which I don't think has been discussed very much, which uh, I, I sort of came up with while uh, re reviewing John Fastaban's uh, REITs dump back on January 20th. One of the things, while well, offloading to hardware is great, we need some way to be able to, to have the limits that the hardware has in software. Because other, otherwise, people who are, are developing applications, routing demons, protocol implementations, and whatnot, they won't be able to, to see how their, 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 their work uh, gets, gets constrained by these things. We have it. It's, already, it's called the rocker switch. Uh, uh, we, uh, can, we can make that software switch do what, have whatever limitations you want to simulate. And then you run it with the rocker switch in QMU and see what happens with all your software. 
Except I, I, I'm, I'm not willing to accept that the rocker s switch is has the same limitations that a lot of the hardware it's programmable. out there. It's a piece of software. We can extend it to do whatever you would like it so, to do. So Dave, the one complication that Rocker would have a hard time emulating is the dynamic, like the shared table case, right? Where like if you, if you had a LPM and you used V6 entries, you might lose twice, you might lose four times the capacity based on how things are tracked. So I think the point Ben is making is we need a signaling mechanism that says, here's the live state through the driver, but that's a driver interface, right? It's something that can be presented through the driver interfaces. Yes, yes, to a degree. I, I mean, like a lot, a lot of the complexities that you end up with in hardware, um, some of the hardware that's out on the market, like the, the Easy Chip is one of these, you can only do certain operations at certain pipeline stages. And and the, the rocker, you might be able to, to put that in, but I mean, a, a lot of it is gonna have to come back from the hardware vendors who are doing this, they have to, they have to show us the, the the model that they they require, so that we can actually go and, and em, em, emulate it. All I can take from this is that you want a facility that is easy to to provide a, a model that can be simulated in software, and whether it's rocker chip, the rocker chip driver, or something else, you don't care as long as you can simulate a capacity issue or a restriction. Um, can I add two things to that? First. Um, you don't know necessarily the underlying implementation of the hardware. Absolutely. You could, uh, multi, you could have a multi-layer try doing various things, and the number of layers are come into effect that are very hard to emulate without knowing extreme details of, of the underlying forwarding plane. The second point I wanted to bring up is, as far as being able to swap out inactive routes, you have to be prepared for very dramatic changes in networks. If you have a large number of routes learned via BGP, and then you have an IGP set of routes, you may have a large number of routes that are completely inactive, but you have an IGP change that happened. And all of a sudden, half your routing table gets lit up that wasn't lit up before. And that looks very disruptive to your network as you reinstall each of those routes to, to try to figure out what you can get rid of. Because your old routes are still not necessarily phased out to the point where you can make that decision. So you can end up with a bubble in time where massive disruption is happening at your box, where a competitive Cisco box, which happened to be still at capacity, is going to be smooth. So that's a challenge. <coughs> so that's a, a two-fold challenge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it, it's different in the data center sure, than no, in my world. No, no, even, even I, I think what pa Patrick's general model was, it's a lazy update. It's not a, you're not actively following the hot list. It's really a capacity right. management thing, right? So if you say you, you had IGP flip, you had a whole bunch of routes that went hot all of a sudden, it's going to be lazily leaked in, and you will see reorder for all the ones that went from software to hardware. But the problem with lazy is, at that point of view, from the customer's perspective- You're gonna see drops. You're while, disruptive yeah, to You're the network. dropping for the time being. And you're yes. also disruptive to the network at the point where you already had disruption. Yep. So for a customer to deploy that, that's very, very so It's a good point. I mean, there is- So what is, this, what is the so solution to the capacity issue that doesn't add any disruption? The solution to the capacity issue yeah. is to really understand that what you want to sell is a box that clearly does a certain thing when capacity is exceeded. So in many boxes, the swap out is exactly what you want, particularly small little boxes, mm -hmm. things yeah. like that, edge routers. Sure. It's awesome. Data center is probably great. What I'm saying is we also need another mechanism where you can say, here's the capacity of the underlying thing. Quagga, you need to break down and stop. Right? Yeah, but what's Which is similar to the model that Juniper and Cisco and Ericsson and everybody else that I've worked yeah, for. I agree, I mean, the main problem is um, you're exceeding the limits. So um, it's hard to right. have some clearly defined behavior after that. Um, the alternative but, solution- But it, that has to be presented to the people in operation. It's an operational point of view. It's a yeah. What I'm saying is that you need both. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's yes, yes, yes. of course. From a, I mean, from a developer point of view, I need to be able to say how my box is going to work. Up to Quagga. Sure. I mean, the yeah. policy should be in user space, and it should be, of course. I mean, you can, of course, I guess, implement multiple policies or make yeah. it programmable or something. Um, I just think um, the alternative we were talking about during lunch uh, would be to um, 
have manually configured fallbacks, like pulling out individual host routes and falling back to some bigger prefix and taking some different route and hoping that the return traffic will still work and so on, which also seems like a solution, but it seems very difficult and labor intensive to actually make this work. So. Yes, um, it's, it's, it's kind of your fault. It right? seems like a problem. That's what I would say. It seems like a problem to actually do that. I think a reasonable default. I'm sure you might have a use case where it's not good enough, but I think for a default, it seems to make sense to me to automatically well try to pull out stuff based on usage. And if if it's not good enough, then you have to manually um, well specify a more fine grained policy. I, I think it's great to have that. What I'm saying though is, yes. from our boxes, we want to be able to have multiple routing protocols or multiple routing suites be able to drop down on our box. Okay. So in that world, I don't want I want each one of those suites to be able to get feedback that I not feedback, that's the wrong word. To be able to get the capability ahead of time so that they don't <coughs> run up to the limit. Because I can't fall back to the swap out sure. mechanism because that'll be disruptive. Yeah, but so um so given you, if you have I'm this I'm I'm making an argument for having both. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, if you have this feedback, um like you know in advance um, at what point you will break down, how would you prevent it? So, so that's, I mean, the, the reason, I, part of the reason I wrote the Flow API was to get this kind of um, ahead of time feedback, right? If you can look at the table and you kind of know the size and, and you know how it's laid out, you can know when it's going to break. And knowing when it's break, now user space can adapt some policy on top of it. I don't, I might have a policy that I think is great and you might have a policy that you think is great and you might have a different <coughs> one. But but it's it's a user space problem now, and the kernel it, it isn't trying to enforce my version of a good policy. Yeah, so we are about to exceed this slot's time limit, and I think we've generally agreed that it's a user space policy with a kernel driver indication. But the kernel must have some minimal policy to make things work. As as is, I think cool. breaking yes. existing model is not an option. So minimal policy, but some in the kernel, and then the rest picked up to logic uh, intelligence in user space. Yeah, okay. sounds great. Awesome. Um, you might want to sit, hang out in the front there. Uh, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the penalty box. <laughs> well, I mean, this is, I think, I think you'll have a lot to say anyway. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about was just the device models that are uh, emerging in the device driver for emerging NICs, emerging switches. Clearly, we have a switch dev option that's going to go do its thing. And we have the, the SRIOV device drivers. We have EVB implementations. We have uh, uh, VEPA implementations, this, that, and whatnot. And, and I think going forward, I think it's important for us as a group to look at what is the baseline, kind of like what you said yesterday. What is the baseline of emerging NICs? For example, is learning a baseline feature, or is non-learning switches that also happen to have SRIOV something that we build the whole system around. Because if we say, as a unified system, that FDB down offload works the same way as on a, on a uh, eNIC or eSwitch NIC and on a physical switch, it makes a lot of the user space policy application methods, models, understandings a lot simpler. So I don't have a real answer. And, and for people who don't know, in my past life, I built a very fancy-ish NIC that has a funny characteristic that the software is available to everybody, but most of you have never seen the Cisco NIC. Um, but uh, and, and now I'm working with switches, and I see that there is a lot of, lot of friction in the two spaces, and there doesn't need to be. I think the models can be easily unified. Uh, looks like Andy is trying to say something, so we'll go with that. But well, while it's not exclusively answering your, your immediate question, um, I just want to make sure that I can get a plug in for tomorrow. Um, I'm giving a kind of a kind of a talk on this. I think it's probably a little bit outside the scope of what we're doing here, but um, I think it's clear that one of the, the difficult challenges that we're seeing is that companies who have things that are companies who are wondering how to write a switch dev compatible driver are wondering where to go next and how to get there. And we've spent the last like eight months talking and talking. I think people are starting to, to understand, but. Um, I don't want to beat that dead horse too much right now. So 10.30 tomorrow, I'm not sure what room it'll be in, but we'll talk about sort of a path and a progression if you're interested in opening up and getting there. Maybe you can explain. I, I didn't 100% follow why, what is the problem with uh, learning 
capable NIC or switch versus a non-loading board. I'm, I just didn't 100% follow what would be the implication of requiring the support. No, um, no, my point wasn't that there is a difference. My point was if you say that layer 2 behavior is X, right? The Linux kernel driver offload mechanism is X. So if it's a layer 2 switch, it fundamentally does learning. It fundamentally does understands what's a local Mac, what's a remote Mac. Maybe we can say it also fundamentally does VXLAN, given everything else we know. That model doesn't need to be different between a VEPA implementation, uh, which is actually, so the problem, okay, maybe let's start it in reverse. The reason why we have Mac VTAP, Mac VLAN, this mode and pass-through mode and that, this and every OVS has been because a lot of different models have been tried to fit and we've tried to look for each model to reach its ultimate sort of manifestation, the perfect ideal. But if we had actually instead, I think today, take a step back and we say, there's a bunch of component functions that all of these guys do that are common, right? The bridging thing is fairly simple. It looks up a Mac VLAN and it forwards, always. Uh, if it's going to do VEPA, sure, it's still a Mac VLAN forward. The offload can be something that the driver could hide, for example. So is the time now correct to take a step back and say all forward-looking drivers should unify to some common, common functional behavior? So the reason why I said uh, learning was NICs traditionally, even the SRIV NICs, have not had learning as an option. But that's, we can make that go away. Right? I mean, we can ask for it to go. So you, you're really looking for a minimal set. Yeah. Um, my statement would be, I think it would be really helpful if we can bring all the DSA drivers, switches on board as well. So I, I, would, I think we should include them in this discussion. They should be defining what's the minimal no set of features. There are no DSA people here, are there? Where's Florian? Hi. Uh, Gilad from EasyG, by the way. So Somebody just know? come ahead of this line, otherwise you're just a voice. Hi, I'm Gilad from... <laughs> I am glad for me chip for those who don't, who don't know uh, just like uh, a sentence I really like the idea of uh, like some common way so uh, the kernel and certainly the users wouldn't care right at least for the common function there's just one danger I think we should be uh, aware of we define the common function we should make sure we don't make it okay so we're going for the lowest common de denominator right that's all right have something common, absolutely, but also have some way that if later, you know, we add something to the Linux kernel networking stack, and there's some hardware that can support this, and maybe other that can't, that doesn't mean that we can't offload to the hardware that can. I, I kind of think that John Fastevin's approach gets us closer to that area. Uh, so there's, there's two there's two sides a aspects of this. I think John Fastevin's work is great for the the end all be all thing where you we know exactly the physical layout of the hardware and we can explicitly load filtering rules or forwarding database entries explicitly in any way sh shape or form and then build things on top of that at the same time I think it was also important that we had an explicit support for just bridge forwarding and now coming up with uh, Scott Feldman's work explicitly supporting L3 forwarding and learning how the trade-offs and the policy decisions work on there, and then at some point in time, maybe implement these things in terms of John Fastevin's work. So uh, I think John's stuff is more about maximum flexibility, knowing exactly what the hardware is capable of, and then that would allow us to build things on top of it. But in the beginning, we have to work on specific problems and see how they work out. But, but you said something that I really like. So you're saying John's thing would go all the way, including Nick's and everything, right? I mean. I mean, John's, so John's work could be used to expose NIC capabilities. Yeah, that would it's not geared to that now, but there's nothing blocking it from doing so. And here, here he comes down the so aisle again. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to comment. So I'd like to add a comment. So John Fasterbenz, be all you can be. And this gentleman's here, they may be slightly different uh, uh, use cases. They have each, both of them have speaking slots. In you you want to speak? Okay, you, you, you've been put on the spot. Yeah. So, in other words, John's is very low level. His is much higher level building blocks. So, uh, if we're on a cutter for everybody, then... Uh, I'm okay with having three abstractions until right. we figure out where we, what we should yeah. do. All right. Well, you know what?
You think you did? <laughs> I, maybe I can say two things. Um, I'd be happy to add bigger building blocks on top of the Flow API if there's a way we can do it, or maybe we can model bigger blocks in terms of the Flow API. I'm not opposed to work, reworking it as needed. Um, and then the other thing, I think there was a question about a software testable thing earlier. Yeah. Um, one idea I had was to, if you could use the Flow API to query the device, a real device, and then we could use it to um, initialize Rocker. I'm looking at Scott maybe, but uh, I think that'd be cool because then you'd have a, a Rocker where you kind of have a world that mapped to the hardware device, and we could kind of do this automatically, right, as we load Rocker. Right. Oh, you've, you've, uh, you've uh -oh, you triggered ben. this. Yeah, guy, yeah, yeah, you woke up Ben from behind. <laughs> he so came like a bull out of. So just a question on the, or, or a comment, whatever, about that. Uh, we keep talking about hardware offload, which is, which is fine. You know, I work for a hardware company, but I keep thinking, where's the hardware and the offload, right? Uh, and what I mean by that is, if you have a Linux system and it's running, uh, just for an example, okay, in a virtual machine, anything outside it that it can request services via the Flow API is offload. Does it have to be hardware? No, it could be, you know, vSwitch or, or whatever. And the reason I think it's important that is that once you realize it's offload, not hardware offload, you realize we're really talking about enabling Linux to do some kind of distributed data plane. Now, it sounds like a big yeah. name, but... Yeah. And uh, the reason that's important and related to what you're saying is that we already have, you know, if we want and can hook it, hook it up something that uh, will let us play out all the limits and, and so on. Once you don't say it's a hardware, right, you're just saying, I'm talking something, can give me these listed services, I don't care how it d does it. Right, so open this, which can connect it to a rocker or something, can be that thing. Uh, it is definitely the case that someone's going to try to provide hypervisor virtualization support for switch offloads through the host. So that would be useful as well, because someone's going to have to provide a model and export what the, what the your part of the capabilities are, are able to do. Um, my comment is, is just, uh, and I'm ending here, that be really useful to stop talking about the hardware offload, even though you know I'm a hardware guy. It's just offload. And you have a second. Okay, I'll shut well, up. Now. Thank you. So, so, so the question that arises to me, and in, in having looked at uh, John's patches, is that they they don't too much is left up to the drivers. We need to, I, if we're going to go down this path of, of using this as a new model for things, we have to define the building blocks and such. And it will end up being that there are, there are quite a few different ones of them. Like, uh, for example, the Realtek chip that I've been playing with, it has the interesting quirk that it's a, a combination uh, hash table plus uh, cam. And different hardware have different hashing algorithms, have different sizes of cams, different restrictions on where you can put entries and, and all this. And if we just leave it as wide open where like, like John has in places where it's defining some of these elements of, of the pipeline using strings to identify them. We don't know what the, the characteristics and behavior of them is. Um, it, it's my opinion and my belief that we should be adding any of the, the, the building blocks that actual hardware uses. We should have a software implementation that, that does something similar to this. And I, I, I don't think that we can necessarily want to have to rely on it being an external part of something like queuing them. Um, but uh, I mean, that's up, up, up to other people. Uh, yeah. Do you have any ideas about modeling a hardware that does something like that? So uh, maybe what I would say is, is, is the TCAM implementation uh, particularly important? I mean, can, can we, we, I think we need to abstract whether it's a TCAM, whether it's a uh, some kind of other implementation that's not yes, a TCAM. Yes, but right? uh, there are lots of TCAM implementations out sure. of there, and they all have slightly different restrictions on so, what they can do. So one thing I, I had is in the in the table layout of those patches, there's table attributes, and what I was thinking, one thought I had was that if your table behaves some slightly way different, we could standardize a set of attributes that yeah. describe it. Um, yes, but we but need to be a little careful to keep that set minimal, right? We don't want to have a, a but, per device. But we attribute. also need to have code that shows us this is how it behaves. If I don't have hardware X yet, I want to know how so it have, behaves. Have a I have software have simulator that at. can sit behind your model and represent every which, single thing you could represent with the model. Which I, I wouldn't be opposed to doing that on like Rocker, <laughs> okay. right? 
I, I really, I really but, would. But Ben, you're going to end up in the same problem that you were actually pointing out earlier, which is, um, so for example, you might say I have a slow TCAM that requires special gated access to lines because it's optimized for the fast access path. And your slow method might be different from uh, John's slow method. And in your case, it's do individual writes. In John's case, it's send a bunch of PIO writes and wait for an acknowledge and then send a DMA. And I don't think we're at this point yet. I think yeah. we have to build the infrastructure first and then yes. decide what we're going to plop on top of it. Um, another thing I want to bring up in this discussion is every single person I've talked to has a different, A, has a different opinion on, on policy, B, is familiar with zero or one implementation of these things. <laughs> Very few people I've dis I talk to know two or more. Um, so I think there's a lear learning process for a lot of people figuring out what the sco actual scope is out there for what hardware can do. And uh, I think maybe we're going to get some of that out of this discussion here because we have people sp talking about specific needs. But I, I don't want to get tangled in the details of what every single person does. We can hash that out on the mailing list for discussion. That, that's something I absolutely agree with. That Jerry, Jerry and I were talking about that over lunch, and uh, you, you, even with John earlier. And yes, w we, we do need to start getting code that shows some of, uh, of what this is out there so that we can start figuring out what parts are common and what part parts and that's don't the reason we have the rocket driver, because there was no diving board that could get us going. We had to create it ourselves. So yeah. anyway. So that's a, I, I'm sure nobody read the screen, but that's actually the next topic which is manage, uh, yeah, it's perfect. It's manage things as discrete devices or as generic pipelines. And it sounds like what we just said is try to build a generic pipeline using Flow API components for now, and we'll call them discrete devices. And maybe over time, discrete device models will emerge, and we will go from there. Yeah. I just wanted to say a few words. Uh, so it's most of the time it is true that uh, whoever is working for a vendor, like Intel, like John familiar with Intel stuff, so just like one implementation, one hardware underneath, somebody is a chip guy, like only familiar with the chip. Uh, I sort of actually have a luxury to know several different implementation, but I cannot share any of the, any of the stuff because of NDAs. So <laughs> the pr and I think that where, where I'm going with this, that Rocker is actually the framework for all of us to share our internal implementations. For all the vendors out there, Intel, EasyShip, Netronome, everyone, Mellanox, Rocker is a free place to expose not your internal details and your secrets that you have in the hardware, but of how the hardware features of the hardware that you're planning to do. And I think that's based on this common, common framework, we'll be able to actually define the proper APIs on top, how to expose it, and so on. Good point. Uh, anybody with those NDAs want to stand up and explain? <laughs> Just for the benefit of anybody who hasn't looked at your patch series, John, can you kind of go into a little bit of detail as what some of the primitives of your Flow API is so they can yeah. kind of understand what the discrete devices are? Okay. Good segue. My, do you want me to do that now? <laughs> All right. So, um, so basically, what I did is I tried to provide a, a an abstracted model of our device, um, uh, and I, I do have a couple devices. Um, but you're you're right; they're both very Intel. So you know, I'm definitely looking for feedback from other people who have different devices how well it maps. But the the, the basic idea is that we'll expose the headers that the hardware supports along with the, um, how the headers are, are put together. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, you, know, you know, you may support so many stacked VLAN headers and so many stacked MPLS labels or something like this. Uh, and through a kind of a graph, you can describe uh, how the hardware header parser actually, can, how deep it can go into packets. And in this way, you can say that this hardware can match on these fields and, and so on. Uh, and then the next piece is that we export a set of actions, and the, the actions are, um, say, kind of what the actions that the hardware supports. You know, some standard ones would be like set field, um, you know, pop a header, push a header, uh, drop a packet forward. So there, there's kind of a minimal set of kind of standard header actions that, that we'll probably need to standardize. As soon as I get it up there? 
And um, the, the important thing would be to kind of minimalize that set, I, I hope. I don't want to have a, hey, I wrote this. Um, <laughs> so th this is uh, something I, I wrote to kind of try to describe um, to other folks what, I, what I'm working on. Um, it's available, obviously. Um, so then the idea is to have a minimal set of actions that describe kind of a large array of, of hardware. And the API I have now, I, I think as we discussed a couple days ago, I, I probably need to do a better job of kind of defining those in the next version. But uh, the idea would be then hardware can push out, I support a push uh, set field on these fields, I support pushing these types of headers, I can pop these types of headers and so on. Um, then the next piece is tables. And so the idea is that this is kind of a model that works pretty well for devices that look like uh, table pipelines, which are the devices I have. Um, I can say it works well for both NICs and switch switches. Um, you know, obviously it doesn't cover every possible abstraction model that your device has. Even my devices have things that. Um, even my devices have things that are not in this model. You know, like I haven't tried to tackle QoS, for example. But I, I'm I kind of firmly in this camp that we're going to have to do this in stages. There's not going to be a whole implementation that we push into the kernel all at once and it's right for every device, right? Um, so this is kind of the first piece. Um, so the tables are exposed as this, this pipeline of tables. It's a t and a table support uh, headers and actions. So you can say I have, a, I have a route table that supports matching on L3. And the actions are uh, setting the IP fields and decrementing the TTL and uh, pushing a VLAN and so on and so forth, whatever you, 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 know, you think routing tables should be doing. And then, um, you know, following the routing table is an ACL table. It supports the drop action, and it has uh, can match on a big array of fields and uh, so on. So th this is kind of how you you put this all together. Um, and then you you know you say how the tables are actually arranged, um, and then this gets pushed into user space via Netlink. And there's some kernel code to ensure that um, the model is correct. You didn't do uh, you didn't export um, kind of wrong things or you didn't uh, do any of this. And then you can set, we have a set rule and delete rule now, so you can add rules to the tables and remove rules from the tables. And the kernel will do things like verify that those rules are valid for those tables. Um, you know, we could add additional validation logic to ensure that there's, you know, it's not just blatantly dumb thing to be doing. Uh, maybe loops would be one of those, fall into that category. If a user tries to add a loop, let's just not let them do that because the switch will, you know, go into some tailspin and not work anymore. So, um, and, and that's the basic primitives, I guess. And then this gets pushed out into uh, user space um, after this kind of core module from the kernel. And then user space can, can read these. You can do things in user space like look at multiple devices and um, try to normalize headers. So you can say, I have uh, four devices in the system and they support this kind of superset of headers, but the, uh, the intersection of all the headers is this. Um, you can do the same things with actions. Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting to do, I guess, with, with applications is to tell the hardware that this is my minimal set and I'm not going to run my application in hardware unless you support these fields and these actions. Um, and this gets you kind of a, an application that's not directly bound to the hardware necessarily. I mean, obviously, if the hardware doesn't support the features you need, you can't run it on the hardware. Well, that's, um, that's the fact of life, I guess, and that's how hardware works. So you'd have to run it in software then. So that's the, the basic. Outline, I think I'm talking for like half an hour about this tomorrow, so. So, the one question I, uh, I think which is on everybody's mind, which interface becomes the master of this? What, what like, like how, how do, do we go The reason go we're on iterating through two kind of separate paths right now is we don't know where this converges at the end. Well, what, what I'm uh, sort of question I'm, I'm pondering is if you have, uh, like, do we make the TC implementation in the kernel go and be subservient to this or master of this? Like, should it be then be going and, and taking these things and can? Pa I, I haven't <laughs> seen Patrick pop out of his chair that fast before, so maybe you want to step aside for a second. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I looked a lot at that stuff um, in regard to smaller devices like Broadcom, Realtek, small routers. And um, my opinion is, I mean, they all do something quite similar. They do flow offloading in the NIC at the end and 
collect all that information, try to push it. My opinion is um, they're doing it pretty much wrong. Uh, some things of that are fine. I think the kernel should stay in control always um, if you're considering flow offloading. If you configure something using TC, um, the TC should be in control uh, because it's basically what the user used to use and also there might be different utilities. You don't need to re reinvent the wheel. You might have these utilities and if the hardware is capable of performing the action the user configured, then it should be pushed to the hardware. If it's not, it should stay in software is my opinion. That also goes for NAT, for routing, for, I mean, uh, for tagging, whatever. I mean, try to offload as much as possible and as soon as it's not possible anymore. I mean, we're talking about flows. Um, you can't keep individual flows out and have different flows uh, handled by the hardware. So it's not really a problem. Um, as soon as, let's say, the user configures HDB, um, there must be a reason why he's doing that. So um, he probably wants the HDB features, and if the hardware doesn't uh, isn't capable of providing that, then um, take it out of the hardware. So I think, just to repeat something you said earlier, I think it should be left up to you. You said something that got me off there, that you should offload everything into the hardware until there's no more to offload. Uh, it, that's a policy decision from the user, correct? Well, basically, yes. Um, the assumption is the user already expressed what he, what he wanted All once right. he configured that stuff. Thanks for clarifying. Be like a feature flag, right, on the net dev. Code that to your out, my friend. So, FDB add, I can specify that to sit in the kernel, to be offloaded, or to or both to happen. I and I set a policy. I think it's preferable to have uh, transparency at that point. If the hardware is capable, and if it doesn't make any difference for the user, then offload it, of course. I mean, it's uh, just. Mike, Mike, Mike. So, the issue w w with some of the offload discussion is sometimes the hardware on its fast path can do order three or four, five orders of magnitude more than what the hardware than what you can do in software. So if you so if you try and do some of this stuff in software, all of a sudden your entire network grinds to a halt. Yes, I fully agree. I mean, so uh, you can't just say if somebody <coughs> configures it, it has to. Uh, has to happen in software if you can't do it in hardware. There yes. are cases where that doesn't work. No, that's not correct in my opinion. I mean, we do have the same problem right now. If I configure my hardware to do something which um, it doesn't support, it doesn't matter if I do offloading or not. If the CPU is too weak, it can't do it, it would break. Uh, that's no difference to offloading at all. The main problem is, um, the main question is, if I configure something, do I really want it to happen or not? I might configure something which is not working actually, which is breaking down my system. Sure, but I still told my system to do it, to try it, and then I will see if it breaks or not. But if I tell my system to use, use for instance, HDB, um, I expect the result to be um, my traffic shaped according to HDB. And if my system is not capable of doing that because it's too weak, well, bad luck, then, um, I will notice and I will decide if I will do something differently or not. But still, I have expressed my what I want the hardware to do or the system to do. The offloading is just part of the system, but it's not in control of the system. Right, but you can't just blanket say, um, give no feedback because if I get the feedback that you can't offload it, I might not want to do it. I agree that you should have some mechanism to figure out what happened. I that, that's, that there's, there's no, there's no. The thing is, we're talking about flows here and not about um, enabling complete offload. So it's kind of different because of the flows, um, the not offloading stuff happens at packet processing time, basically. So there is nothing to give feedback to. Um, it's nothing you can do actually. <laughs> I think there's something fundamentally different, right? So far, all our users were expecting software performance, that they would not have used software interfaces and expected harder performance. And with this kind of API, we'll have users which require harder performance, and they have to be sure it has to be guaranteed that the, that, that the performance requirements are met. Otherwise, it should not be um, configurable. I think a, it's a different set of use cases. It's enterprise switching use cases, I think, we're, we're talking about here. Maybe you can, you, you can add to that. Actually, can I just say one thing real quick? Yeah. Do not neglect the operational cost of things. Well, From I the point of view of somebody, I've worked at the biggest routing vendors out there, and th you're constantly bombarded with what are your operational costs. So if you're configuring something in the heat of the moment to deal with a networking problem, uh, an attack or something like that, you want to have feedback that 
the thing that I just entered is actually going to be disruptive to the box that I entered it on. So sometimes you know that what you entered is a low probability thing, and it's OK. But you need the feedback. And the feedback has got to come from the kernel. Yeah, but um, <coughs> I see what you're saying. Um, my opinion is that the user actually, I mean, if he's this is specialized hardware. If he adds something like that, he should know what the hardware is capable of uh, or not. And sure, you can provide feedback, but I guess that would be um, probably up to the user space utilities to um, so figure out if it's. I'm right not to sure. Where do you want to provide, uh, provide feedback for flow offloading? I mean, the offloading happens during packet processing. So, uh, uh, so we're seemingly going back in circles on this one. Was there a hand up? Uh, agree. Um, so I, I think I, I think it's. For all the use cases we talked about, just like uh, what Thomas said, I think there are definitely use cases where automatic remedial action would be surprising to people. I agree. Action yes. may not. So I think whatever happens, there might be, even if the kernel automatically has a remedial policy, there has to be an override. And that, I think, addresses your concern, where you say anybody deploying enterprise switching, for example, or gateway routers will set the policy up top to say, don't take remedial action without telling me. I get to decide what the remedy is. Not necessarily. You know, you want feedback that it happened. That's a, that's a user space process problem. But, but it's a user space process problem that has to come from the kernel. Because you don't know, you can't from n number of user space processes, whether it's configuring TC, TC or protocol or policy or something like mm -hmm. that, it's independent of what the hardware can do. And you don't want to have. The Yes, I agree with that. But there's no mechanism to do that yeah, signaling. Yeah, no, so that signaling can't. We, we need to write that. <laughs> so, Patrick, this is this this stuff is why I said we need a boolean bit that says if you can't put it in the hardware, let me know and don't put it. Don't put the rule in. Yeah, sure. I'm just wondering um, how the kernel is supposed to provide any feedback because if you're talking about flow offloading, basically the question whether a flow can be offloaded or not can be made once the packet, the flow has been handled in software. And the kernel can't know before it actually hits some feature, before the flow hits some feature. I think we're which talking about the space where people are adding routes or ACLs and stuff like this. Yeah, but okay, that's... That's kind that, of different. That, that's I think. what they're concerned about. Yes, but that's kind of different. I think um, from the from offloading. Well, yes. For instance, like yeah, I'm mainly talking about the smaller devices, of course, um, like the regular home router, and um, these devices make the decision based on the actual packet processing. The packet gets processed, and once it um, the processing is complete, the offloading decision gets made. So there's basically. Um, you would have to predict what happens to the packet um, to decide if it's capable of getting offloaded or not. So you have to make a prediction of the entire behavior of the packet path of everything which will be applied to the packet, which is a very hard thing to do correctly. Um, so it's um, my question is at what point would you provide feedback when you configure something? You would have to predict the outcome of a packet um, classification, routing, net, um, whatever um, process. And this is very difficult to do. I don't think it's possible to do that in a way that doesn't leave tons of open holes or corner cases which are not handled correctly. I think another thing that, that's, that hasn't been said explicitly is that, yes, it is true that we have multiple APIs we're working on to solve different aspects of this problem, and there's lots of overlap. And it, it, is, it could be the case that it's somewhere down the line we figure out that, oh, you know, this, this particular set of APIs was the right trade-off, and that's what we should converge to. And it's possible that some of these driver interfaces we're designing now might not even exist five or six years from now as we convert things. Uh, I guess one of the advantages of only having one driver right now is that we don't have a lot of shit to convert <laughs> when, uh, <laughs> if we get rid, of, get rid of one set of APIs. But at some point, we're going to reach critical mass, and we have to make sure our interfaces are pretty damn solid at that point. Uh, actually, regarding the question previously about information um, available without an NDA, um, these vendor SDKs for the small, the Realtek, uh, Broadcom, et cetera, SDKs, they include some crappy drivers, um, which are not high quality, but um, they contain enough information to easily figure out what the hardware is actually doing and capable of by looking at the headers and the, the hardware descriptors, et cetera. And these are available, so anyone interested can quite easily um, get at that stuff. And actually, the, I think for the smaller devices, I know there is a fair amount of interest for people to also contribute specs to open source. So if we can put enough of the framework in place, I think you'll see 
I mean, I, I can connect individual people who might have some interest to some of these companies as well. Okay, so. I just had a comment about uh, uh, the feedback API and mentioning that, you know, a lot of the times in hardware, I really don't want to make much of a comment here because I don't want to prolong the conversation. Um, but there's situations in which several network functions are going to be implemented by shared hardware. And in those cases where we're trying to solve this problem, uh, we're sort of ruining our capabilities mechanism that we discussed a little while ago, whereby, you know, you originally are told I can handle 10 million routes, but all of a sudden TC wants to do some filtering and it's on shared hardware and that capability is now incorrect. I'm sorry to poop on the party, but <laughs> you got like five minutes or less. Yes. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm, There's I'm another session at yeah, so uh, for the next five minutes, uh, we're going to have Jiri come up. We're going to rearrange a little bit. So, yeah. Do you want oh, five question? minutes is it? Okay. All right, so <laughs> we're doing questions for five minutes, I guess. Go you for it. it. Okay, so I'm one of the sites that does essentially home routing. And one of the things that I look at when I listen to people talk about offload is that you see the create and delete of how you want to handle a flow going down to hardware, but you have to update Linux to keep all of its state in track. We've, and already, I don't we, see we've designed this so that that's what happens. So, that, so when we add a route, we add it to the So it's not just the route, it's, con it's contract has to be kept up to date. If you're doing PPP, you have we to will have PPP so we, we, we definitely plan on having the software tables have the state, oh, you mean like contract and stuff? Yeah, I see yeah if on. I might Right, so how do, you, how do you get it's not back really, from the hardware it's offload quite, it's quite the easy. information back up into the kernel? It's quite easy, you don't need a lot of information. Basically, the connection tracking and software has timers, so if it doesn't see any packet on the CPU, the timers will at some point expire. So instead of um, killing the flow, you will call back to the hardware and query for this exact flow, is it still active if, if, um, if it is active? You reschedule the timer. If not, you do the regular software processing. Regarding counters and stuff like that, um, at the point where the user actually requests the counters, at that point you carry back to the hardware. But it's very um, few cases where we actually need to do that. In connection tracking, the only thing which actually requires active flow state is um, timers. That's it. And, and in general, the model would be you want to leverage Netlink as much as possible, right? You want to send signals back to the kernel Send it to Netflix. Yeah, yeah, so uh, let, let's, let me just close then. So um, people know that we are going to do another session, right? So this, um, we had anticipated the popularity. Uh, so we're going to have another two and a half hour session, is that right? It's yeah, uh, we, the last person talking is going to shut down the mic before they leave. Uh, that's the strategy. So we're going to continue again, and we do have an agenda, as you can see. So just so you get a good, quick chance to take a look at where you stand. We finished with John. So Miha is going to talk about P4, Jiri about TC, and some flow uh, rebuttals. Is that the right way to say it? Uh, yeah. We're going to have Gilad from EasyChip talk a little bit. <clears throat> we're going to talk about how. Uh, capacity indication and some of the things that we're doing in the switch dev space. Um, and then we have uh, Scott's going to talk about Rocker. He, this might be one of the surprise items. Um, Sanjay San is going to talk about switch abstraction API. Uri, if he is here. Is Uri here? OK. <coughs> Wasn't he hosting the second session? Uh, <laughs> or something like that? I saw Rad yesterday. Ah, missing. Um, and we have uh, Oliveri from Qualcomm. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about features. Uh, I know Hannes wanted to talk about a few things from a L3 offload capability perspective and things that Linux could do better at, system-wide load balancing, et cetera. So as you can see, it's a very short agenda. We'll be done in 15 minutes in the next session. Um, so, see you in, uh, in two hours? Two hours, right? Jamal, two hours? We continue in two hours here? Here. 4.30? We see you in four th uh, at 4.30 right here. Thank you. <laughs>